Yeah, my goodness, every one of those are encouragements for us to do just exactly, well, I think, what the Scripture's been encouraging us to do and what I've been trying to, uh, for lack of a better term, amble my way through over the last couple of weeks. I, I know that you know, many of you have the outlines from uh, three weeks ago, and I've been on this thing for two or three weeks, and uh, hopefully hadn't made a mess out of it, but uh, <laughs> I feel like sometimes I, I kind of get in my own way uh, trying to share with you uh, some of the concepts and truths that the Lord has laid you know, before me during the week to share with you because God wants you to know this and he wants to reveal this to you. I just will remind you that truth is not discovered. Truth is revealed. And when the Lord gets ready for you to, to learn a certain truth, then he's going to reveal it to you. And many times the way he reveals it to you is through someone like me. It's not always true, you know. Uh, some, many times I'm just about, you know, half a step ahead of the hounds, if you understand, if you understand that. I mean, I'm running, I'm running and the hounds are after me and I'm about a half step in front of you. So as the Lord just begins to open some things up to me, then I begin to share with you and I'm, I'm not too far ahead. I'm just right about a half a step ahead. And, and so many times, you know, the Lord uh, reveals things to me and, and I get excited about them. And as I get excited about them, it, I, I'm just compelled to share with you. And those of you that are here on Wednesdays, like at, at, at prayer meeting, that has become more of a, uh, of, a, of a life group almost rather than just a strict prayer meeting. You guys know this because I can't keep my mouth shut uh, on Wednesday nights. A lot of times what I'm studying for Sunday kind of pops out on Wednesday night. It just seems like the Lord opened some doors. You know, I mean, somebody asks a question or says something and it just pop, it just, it just makes it self available to just pop out every, what the Lord's been saying in my life. And I, I hope this is beneficial to you because, uh, you know, I've been with the Lord for 45, 46 years, 47. I, I, everybody, somebody add up 16 and 64, and, you know, and that's how long I've been with the Lord. And so I've been with him a long time, and I've been through many, um, many um, uh, presentations of, of God, of how to look at God, and how to view God, and how to, how to walk with him, and, and, com and for him to complete himself in, in us. And that's the real big question, I think, of the Christian life, and that is all these wonderful promises that God gives, like we've just been singing about. You know, I'm going to sing my way out of the valley. I'm going to shout on the top of the mountains. I'm going to praise my way. My weapon is a melody. And, I, you know, and all of those are concepts of how God uses issues in our life to let us come before him and do what is necessary to be delivered from these things in life. Now, the enemy of our soul would convince us that, that being free and being victorious in the Christian life has everything to do with the way we perform. And by performance, I'm not talking about standing up on a stage like I'm doing right now and performing before you as some kind of stage actor presenting something. When I talk about performance, I'm talking about the way you live your life. I'm talking about those things that people look at your life and evaluate you by. Whether you're a strong person or you're a weak person or you have uh, issues that you're, you don't know certain things and so you're not capable or you're immature and you're judged by that or you have certain inabilities that uh, create weaknesses in your life and people look at you and they evaluate you and they make they they they, they either reject you for this or they you know they see me, people roll their eyes people you know stand with some kind of countenance that lets you know that you're not accepted or that what you did was you know immature childish we in other words we're, we're we're all as human beings our our number one need in life is to be loved and the way we receive love is, is by acceptance. You know, when, when, people, when people accept us, when people say positive things about us, when people look at us with favor, when people respond to us in ways that show approval and so forth, this is interpreted by us as love. To be accepted means 
that I'm loved and, and that's what I need. And so I grasp onto that. And so this becomes a tool that the enemy can use to control our lives. In other words, he can, he can convince us that whether other people accept us is what's really important in life. And so what we end up doing is trying to do everything we can to be accepted by other people so that we can sense this love in life. And so the enemy uses that to push us toward performing right and, and so that others will accept us. So if, if love is our number one need in life, then our number one fear in life would be rejection. And by rejection, I'm talking about disfavor. I, I mean, you know, somebody doesn't have to just look at you and say, you know, you're ignorant or you don't make the grade or I don't think you know what you're talking about. I mean, it doesn't have to be that uh, up front. It can just be those little signs of displeasure. Somebody rolling their eyes or, you know, you know turning their back, uh, wagging their head. Uh, their countenance just infers that whatever you just did or whatever you are or whatever you said is unacceptable, and that's a rejection in life. When people criticize you, when they, when they talk to you about the, the weaknesses of your life, why, why can't you do better than that? I thought you were more mature. You call yourself a Christian. I mean, all of these are controlling statements that, is, that are used by the enemy spoken usually through other people in our life to imply that we're not performing the way we need to perform, thereby causing us to say, I need to perform better. I need to do better. I need to learn more. I need to present myself better. And all this is is a subtle way, a very subtle way, that the enemy of our soul convinces us that in order to be good and right and accepted in life is to learn to up our game, to learn how to perform better, to be better at doing what we do. And this is a very subtle control factor that the enemy uses in our life. So what this message that's now stretched out over three weeks is an attempt to do is an attempt to tell you two things. Number one, to identify the, the fact that you have weakness in your life. So the first thing you have to do is recognize that this is a weakness in my life. I mean, you're not going to ever deal with it as a weakness and know what to do with it because it is a weakness if you don't see it in your own life. And it's very easy to pass these things off and not to see them at all because you're being encouraged by an enemy that wants to keep you in the darkness because it's the devil that works in the darkness. As a matter of fact, he's called the prince of darkness. So everything that happens in your life that is in the darkness is an area which Satan controls. God never does things in darkness. God always does things in light. The very first act of God on this earth, according to the book of Genesis, it says in the first verse that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The second verse says, and the earth was without form and it was void and darkness covered all the deep. And the next verse says, and God said, let there be light. And it was, and it was good. And then God goes on to create the earth and create the heavens and create the animals and create the plants and create people. Every bit of that from the, from the first commandment on everything God did was in the light. The first thing he did is create light, and then everything he did was done in the light. And what I'm saying to you is, that's a principle of God, that when God works in your life, he's going to work in the light. The devil is the one who's going to work in the darkness, and as long as, God, as, long as the devil can keep you in the darkness by causing you not to see what's going on in your life, not to recognize it, not to accept it, not to know what it is and how to deal with it. That's the darkness that the enemy uses to control our life. We all have holes in our soul, if you want to picture it this way. Our soul that God breathed into us and we became a living being. You know, when, when we have hurts and, and, and issues and pains and rejections, and all, it kind of puts, if you want to picture it this way, it kind of puts a little tear in our soul. 
And so anytime the enemy wants to control our life, what he'll do is he'll, you know, metaphorically, he'll stick his finger into one of those holes. And, and, and when we're moving forward, he just sticks his finger in there and he uses that weakness to drag us back down into the darkness. Well, the only way these holes can be healed in our life is to get them into the light. Because when we get them into the light, that's where God works. And God says, if we'll get them into the light and you'll recognize what these things are and accept these things in your life and, and, and own these things in your life, not try to cover them up, not try to dismiss them, not try to deny that they're not there. But once you open yourself up to these things in your life, then he, through his Holy Spirit, can heal these things in your life and can move you past trying to perform your way out of these weaknesses that you have. And God can take you forward because the, the enemy's trying to convince you that God is repulsed by you, that your weaknesses make God want to deny you, that it is your weaknesses that embarrass God, that God's ashamed of your weaknesses, and that God's in heaven looking at you saying, can't you do better than that? Why are you still so weak? I have been with you so long. Haven't you learned it? I mean, the enemy is convincing us that that's the way God looks at our weakness. But I'm telling you that it is the exact opposite of that. God is not repulsed by your weaknesses. As a matter of fact, God is attracted to your weaknesses. God moves into your weaknesses because God says, my perfect strength is made strong in your weaknesses. It's not your strengths that God works through because in our strengths, we're encouraged to trust ourselves, right? I mean, if we're strong in an area, we, we, we don't have the tendency to go to God and say, God, I need your help. I, I, need, I can't do this by myself. I'm, I'm all alone. I'm your child, God. And, and I'm just giving this to you because I know I can't do it. No, 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 no. In our strengths, we're cocky about them most of the time. We're arrogant about it. We say, well, I can handle this. I know what to do with this. All right, God, that's all right. I, I, I can take care of this. And that's how our strengths encourage us to be. So God says, instead of being repulsed by your weakness, I love your weakness. You know why? Because it is your, in your weakness that I can come into your life and I can make myself strong on your behalf. I've I, have I shared with you my magic wand theory? My magic wand theory, now, now don't get too spiritual about this because I shared this one Wednesday night with the, with the, with the prayer slash Bible group uh, and, and they got all spiritual about it and tried to mess it up. But, um, but think about this. This is my magic wand theory. And just think about this on the surface level, all right? Don't, don't, don't try to be too spiritual about this. I'm trying to make a point here. All right, it's, let's suppose that we have a magic wand, and I give everybody in the sanctuary a magic wand. And with this magic wand, what we can do is we can wave this wand over ourselves and change anything about our life. Uh, physical things, uh, emotional things, spiritual. I mean, we can, want, we can wave this wand over our life and all of a sudden, presto, whatever's wrong with our life is made right. Well, my, the, the theory is, my theory is that once you wave this wand over your life, you will never need God again because whatever it is that you would change about your life is why you need God. In other words, God wants us to need him because it is in our need that we are brought to him. It, 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 is, it is what we're praying for that would be changed about our life, that we go to God and say, God, I need you to work in my area of this life. It, it, I mean, because after all, the Bible says that we are sheep. And not only are we sheep, we're dumb sheep. And, and dumb sheep need a shepherd, right? And so God is our shepherd. So when we sheep know that we're dumb and that we're apt to make dumb choices and go in wrong directions, that's when we say, we need a shepherd. We got to have a shepherd. Or we're children, the Bible says, and we're immature children, and we don't know what we need. And so we need a heavenly father that can take these immature children and lead them in the right direction. So what God does in many times in life is that God doesn't 
automatically meet every need that we have in order that we might have a reason to come to him and allow him to have input into our lives. Think about it, parents. It's the same thing you do. I think I challenged you last week to think about life this way. I mean, you as parents, you have children that are growing up, right? Well, when they get to be about 18 years old, uh, they're going to come to a point where they're going to want to be on their own and be independent and blah, blah, blah. Well, if you parent, if you say, okay, once you get 18 years old, I'm going to give you everything that you need from now on in your life. I'm going to give you all the money you want. You can get your own place. You can buy an automobile. You don't have to work. I mean, you can just go out and because I'm supplying everything you need, there's no reason for you to want after anything. There's no reason for you to come back to me and allow me me to input into your life. There's no reason why you would even consider me because I have given you everything in advance that you want. No, no, we parents don't do that, do we? Well, one of the reasons why is because we don't really want our children to become independent of us completely at 18 years old. Why? Because we know they're not mature enough. We know that there are things that they would decide that would kill their life, that would destroy them. So what we really need is an opportunity in the future to come back and have a little input into their life. And and, and why are they going to come back to us and allow us to have this input? Because they need us. They have a need that they can't supply, so therefore now we become part of their life because we didn't give them everything they needed up front, and and we have a chance now to input. I'm just saying our Heavenly Father is like this, and that many times the weaknesses of our life have been placed there by God in order that we might need Him in life so that He can input into us and have an effect on our life. So in looking at the weaknesses of your life, and I ask you the first message, how many of you have some weaknesses? And immediately every, (laughs) yeah, I see you raising your hand. I mean, it's not hard, is it? Because our weaknesses are so obvious, and we all have them. So I've encouraged you, all right, let's look at the weakness of your life, and let's just see what God wants to do in the weaknesses of our life. And so we dealt with, uh, I think, with four primary weaknesses. Uh, This should be it. Inabilities was one. We all are... You know, we all have things we don't do well. We all have things that we haven't learned. Iniquity, iniquity just means we've been reared by a family or a group or whoever it might be, and the way they believed and the way they acted and the way they did and the way they treated people and all of the issues of their life get transferred to us. And so as we live our life, we're bent in a certain direction and we're out to act just like they acted, which means we're, we're, we do things wrong and we don't do things right and we're not led by God because our families weren't. So almost everybody in here uh, has some bent in life that God wants to do this to. He wants to straighten it out in life. So uh, sometimes it's an iniquity. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I've ever met anybody that doesn't have some iniquity in their life that needs to be dealt with. A third way was infirmity, which means I'm weak, I'm uh, hurting in some area. Paul called his weakness, his infirmity, a thorn in the flesh. You know, And he prayed, God, remove it. And God said, I'm not going to remove it, but I'm going to give you the grace to live with it. And that's an infirmity in life. And then the last one was an inherent weakness, which is a weakness that's been placed there by God. And I know this is hard to imagine that God would actually create some weakness in your life, but it is obviously true. And we have two great characters in the Bible that we've looked at. And just to mention them, Moses and Paul are two people that God birthed with some weakness into their life, which you would think that God, if God was going to, if God was going to use somebody to lead the nation of Israel out of bondage, you would think that one thing God would give them would be the ability to speak well, right? I mean, if God's going to send you before the Pharaoh of Egypt, it seems to me that when you're born, that your DNA and your genetics would be created by God in order to, uh, to create someone who had a wonderful voice, a pleasant countenance, and be able to speak their way through any situation of life. That makes sense that God would make you that way. But according to Moses, the first objection he had to God, when God said, I want you to go deliver the people, what was the first objection that Moses had? God, I don't speak very well. Moses said, God, you didn't make me with the ability to talk, so I can't go because you didn't give me the ability to talk. And what did God say? Moses, who made your mouth? In other words, God said, hey, Moses, You don't think I made you the way I wanted you to be? You you think I messed up? You think I made a mistake in creating you this way? Is that what you're saying to me? 
I, I don't make mistakes like that. I created you the way I made your mouth the way I wanted to be. And God didn't want a slick talker to deliver Israel from bondage. You know why? Because if he created a slick talker to deliver Israel from bondage, the whole world would say, Moses went down there and talked Pharaoh out of the slaves in Egypt instead of God delivered them because God had a purpose for their life through signs and wonders, not through some slick talking salesman. So God created a weakness in Moses in order that God could get the glory rather than Moses. And the apostle Paul was the same way. What was the apostle Paul being criticized for by the Corinthians? He was being criticized for two things. One is they said, hey, you write great letters. Uh, as a matter of fact, the whole New Testament, there are 27 books in the New Testament. 13 of them were written by the apostle Paul. 13 of the 27 books in the New Testament and maybe 14 if you consider that Hebrews was written by the Apostle Paul. Over half of the New Testament was written by the Apostle Paul and every one of those books are letters that Paul sends to other Christians about the theology and how to look at life and, and, and led by the Holy Spirit how to be in life. But the Apostle Paul evidently had a weakness and this weakness was something that he was born with. This is a way God created him. And you would think that if God was going to use someone to be the, the, the most influential person in the New Testament world, that God would have created him with the ability to be very fluent, to be very charismatic, to be very gifted, and for people just to fall in love and listen to his wonderful, melodious voice and be attracted to him so that the gospel could be shared by him and people would just fall at his feet and listen and hear and believe because of his magnetism and his charm and his wonderful presentation of the gospel. He would be a beautiful person that people would be attracted to. And make no mistake about it, beautiful people are preferred in this world. I mean, I know this because I've been preferred all of my life. <laughs> no, it is true, though, really. Seriously, beautiful people, I don't know what it is. People love symmetry or something. I, we're, 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 we, give, we give beautiful people every break in the world. I mean, really. We, humanity just loves beautiful people. But the Apostle Paul was obviously not beautiful, and he didn't have a great voice because the criticism, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, the Apostle Paul says, I know what you're saying about me. What you're saying about me is, hey, you don't need to come by here so often. The Corinthians were saying, hey, Paul, you know, give yourself a break. Don't, don't, don't worry about coming by here as often as you do. Because frankly, uh, your letters are great. Your letters are weighty. In other words, you, you, you share good stuff in your letters. Your letters are authoritative. Your letters are, are outstanding. What you write is beautiful. And we, we love, when we get a letter, we read it out loud, and it just, boom, convicts us, and boy, the Holy Spirit just boom, carries it through. But when you come in person, uh, you're not very attractive, and you're a bad talker. I mean, I hate to be that blunt with you, but that's really the truth. So don't worry about coming by here so often. Just send us a letter, all right? Now, how many of you would say this is hurtful? Uh, no matter how you look at it, that's hurtful, right? Uh, I mean, here's a group of people that he pastored and he won them to the Lord and he sacrificed, he used his gifts and everything to, to even create a church. And now that church has been encouraged by other roving apostles, probably many of them looking for money and power and so forth, to, 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 to criticize the, the man who God used to even start this church. And now they're saying, uh, you're a dud. So the way people look at weakness and the way God looks at weakness are two different things. When people look at weakness, here's what people say. Weakness is a, is a liability. Because you're not attractive and because you don't speak well, you're a dud. That's what people do with weakness. They, they look at us and they say, that's a liability in your life. That's a problem in your life. That is something that you need to do better about. You need to learn to perform better. You need to go get some voice lessons. You need to do something, man. Work on your personality. Come on, be a little more outward. Be a little kinder, sweeter. Uh, get some plastic surgery on that eagle beak nose and your little squinty body and your bald head. And I mean, the Apostle Paul was not an attractive person. He was an ugly little fellow. But the world would say, make yourself more beautiful and people will like you more. And that's an attempt to control who you are 
by teaching you to perform in better ways. And this is a control factor in life because no one wants to be rejected. And if I'm ugly, people will reject me in life. So the devil says, well, learn to perform better. Well, you know what the apostle Paul told them when they said that? Hey, I'm not going to perform better for you. I'm just telling you right now, here's what, I don't want anybody to perceive anything about me other than what they see me to be and what they hear from me. So I, I presented the gospel the way God gave it to me, and you may look at this at weakness, but I've asked the Lord what to do about it, and here's what the Lord said. Don't worry about it, Paul, because in your weakness, I am made strong. So the way God look, the way people look at weakness is that it's an inabil- that it, that it's an inability in your life and it is a, a liability and you need to do something about it. The way God looks at the same weakness in life is this is an opportunity for me to show myself strong on your behalf. So in these weaknesses that you and I have in life, God is saying, if you will do right with these, then I can take that weakness and I can show myself mighty in your life, and you give it to me, and I can do something with that weakness in your life, but you're going to have to bring it into the light because I don't work in the darkness, so the enemy is encouraging you to be ashamed of your weakness and to be fearful that if you show anybody your weakness that they're going to reject you. So he uses... He uses shame and fear to push us into the darkness about the weaknesses in our life so that we stay in the realm of the enemy who works in the darkness and we don't step into the light that God can use and God can use that revelation of this thing to show himself mighty in your behalf. So then, here's something new. These are the weak ways we're weakness. Let's t- deal with these very quickly. These are four basic ways that people handle weaknesses in their life. This is how people do when they, when they, when they understand that they have weakness. Now, three of them are going to be the wrong way. One of them is going to be the right way. This is obviously the wrong way. Uh, people give up in defeat. I mean, sometimes when you have a weakness, it's really encouraging. I mean, you're really encouraged just to, just to give up. Uh, let, me, let me back up. I just pushed that. Let me put it down. I'll push it again. Um, there's in, the, in, the, in the book of uh, John, chapter 5, there's a, there's a group of people laying around a pool uh, in, in a little place called Bethesda. You, you've read this in the Bible? Well, there, the, 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 the pool is surrounded by a bunch of uh, decks, uh, patios, decks. And on these patios are laying all kind of sick people. Because the, the word is that uh, at some time during the year, an angel from heaven would come down and stir the waters of this little pool of Bethesda. And the first person into the pool after the stirring of the waters was made well of whatever disease they had. Well, of course, all these sick people are laying on these porches hoping to be the first one in the pool. And Jesus approaches the scene. And, Jesus, and the Bible says that Jesus sees a man and, and that he knows that this man had been laying there a long time. Matter of fact, he knows that this man's been laying there for 38 years. Everybody say, that's a long time. Yeah, 38 years is a long time to be laying there waiting to be the first one into the pool, Right? All right, and Jesus walks up to the man who he knows has been laying there 38 years, and he asks him a question that seems to be a ridiculous question. And the question to the man is, Sir, do you, want, do you really want to be made well of the disease you have? And, of course, the obvious answer of the man is, Well, I sure do, you know, implying that, Hey, I've been laying here 38 years trying to get healed. I mean, what would make you think I don't want to be healed? Well, the obvious inference of Jesus and this miracle is that not only was this man's body sick, but his, his spirit was also defeated. Because if you've been laying there for 38 years, it seems like one time in 38 years, if you really wanted to be healed, 
somehow you would find some way to get into the pool after 38 years of life. I'm just saying to you that what this signifies basically is Jesus asking this guy, do you really want to be healed? And the guy said, well, I used to, but shoot, man, I can't get in the pool. That's what he said. He said, every time I try to get in there, somebody be. In other words, he had given up in life. Now, I'm just saying to you that it's very easy to, to give up in your weakness. It's easy to get overwhelmed by the issues of your weakness. And, and, and I've had this exposed in my own life. I know this may shock you, but being a pastor all these years, there have been many times where I've just wanted to give up. I mean, I, I've worked hard. I've tried to lead churches. I've tried to win people. I've tried to save, uh, uh, lead people to salvation. I've tried to change the, the, the way Christians look at things and so forth. And I've been rejected so often and rejected so much and criticized so often that many times I was just at the point where I was ready to give up. As an example, in the last ministry that I led before we started Freedom River Church, which was uh, 12 years ago, uh, I had come to that point. I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd led another ministry for nine years, and I had done everything that I possibly could to change the order, to affect things, to have influence over people, and so forth and so forth. And man, it was just a constant battle, a constant fight, a constant warfare, uh, criticism on every hand, rejection on every hand. And I had come to the point where I pretty much had decided to, well, hey, I'm going to give up. I've got to get out of here. I had become depressed. I thought about, man, I'm going to have to get on some antidepressants. I'm so rejected and disgusted. And, and see, that, that, that's what happens a lot of times in our weaknesses. We just get so bombed for so long and such rejection happens, we just finally say, well, pff, man, I'll just give up. I, hey, I'll just go with the flow. I'll just do what... And, and you have a tendency to do this. Now, what this does is it keeps you in the darkness where the enemy can keep you bound under that thing. You know how I got delivered from that? This is going to surprise you. The worst thing that's happened on this coast in the history of the coast, as far as I know, brought me out of that. You know what it was? Katrina. Yeah, Katrina hit. Biggest old disaster in the world. You know, everything was torn up, and I know you guys were here. Many of you guys were here, and you, you saw it, and it, it just devastated. It looked like somebody had dropped a bomb. I mean, every, there wasn't a telephone pole standing. Or everything was gone, blown down, fences blown over. It was just horrible and everything. First thing I did was go to the church, and when I got to the church, you know what I thought? First thing thought that crossed my mind, I'm not qualified. I thought, man, what are we going to do? And the Lord said, well, you know, in my spirit, he spoke to me. He said, well, you're going to do what's necessary to get this thing straightened out. You're going you're gonna to work. You're going to get things. You're going to fix things. You're going to make things better. You're going to be used by me to do great things and lead great things and do a lot of, of issues and so forth. And I thought to myself, here's the first thought I had. I'm not qualified. You know why? Because I've never been trained in anything like this. I don't have the credentials. I don't know what to do. I, and the Lord looked at me, and I think I heard from him in my spirit that says, uh, you're not qualified. <laughs> but my grace qualifies you, see? And he said, you just listen to me, and I'll tell you what to do. And I'm going to tell you, any of you guys that were around during that time, uh, God just used us greatly. I mean, it's, it's amazing. We were right in the forefront of everything, right in the center. And I can just recount miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle that right here before your eyes where God just moved in tremendous ways. I had nothing to do with it, but I learned one thing. If I'll just let God use me, he can do great things. It's just overwhelmingly amazing. Give you one example. You interested in one example? I'll make it quick. One example. We had all kinds of supplies and people were coming from everywhere. They had to have the National Guard block all Pass Road. There were so many people coming to our church in need. And the National Guard had to stand out there and direct people in because there were so many people lined up all the way down to Highway 49 from around the Pass Road area right up in there. A lot, long, lot of people. And... Uh, one of the things we had stacked up against the wall of the building on the outside of the building, because we had no power, no refrigeration, anything like that, and, um, and that we had bags of ice, uh, just, just stacks of, of bags of ice that FEMA brought in and the independent people brought in. And as people would come through, almost everybody would need a bag of ice or so. Well, there was a group that was, uh, uh, they were put up by the government, but they were staying in one of the elementary schools on Pass Road, and they came down there in a little uh, Volkswagen Beetle, I mean, Volkswagen uh, van, 
and they looked like a bunch of hippies, you know, in the old van. And they drove up there, and there were about six or seven people in there. And here's what they said. They said, Pastor, uh, we're down here at, the, at this school, uh, and, and uh, I think it was Pass Road Central Elementary right there. And they said, we're, we're being housed down there, but we don't have any ice. So we got about 45 people down there, and we don't have any ice. Do you have any ice that we can have? And I looked over there, and there were four bags of ice. That was all we had. Now, I know that four bags of ice is not going to help 38 or 39 people, but that's all we had. And so the person that was helping them said, Pastor, uh, they need some ice, and we only have four bags. What, do you want us to give them one of those bags? And I looked at the line, and it was stretching all the way down and all the way down. way well, You couldn't even see the end of it. And I, and I said, no, yeah, just give them all four of those bags. And they said, well, if we give them all four of those bags, we're not going to have any bags left. And I said, well, I don't think four bags is enough for all of these people that I can't even see the end of the line. So here's what I'm going to say to you. If God wants those people to have ice, God's going to send ice. Because we obviously don't have enough ice for all of them. So since this is God's business, let's just go with God. Give them every bag we have over there. And I promise you, we gave them every bag. And as soon as I turned, seriously, as I, Tanya was there with me. And, and of course... God gave me a wonderfully honest wife. She won't pretend. Thank God. I have a tendency to pretend a lot. I was trained that way and brought up that way. You know, that's why I, I know how to tell stories because uh, I, my whole life was a story when I was brought up. I was so poor, I just created a whole other life for myself. I mean, I'm wonderful at inventing things and pretending. But so, so God gave me a wife that won't pretend. Thank God for an honest wife that won't pretend. But anyway, I'm standing there, and, I, and, I, and immediately, once I said, I looked down the sidewalk, and there was an 18-wheeler that was slowly pulling up right there at the end of that, of, at the end of that uh, sidewalk, and there was another one behind him. And I turned, and I walked, and I saw a, a little short guy, a truck driver. He was walking right straight toward me down that sidewalk, and I looked, and the first thing he said is, hey, do y'all need some ice? And I promise you, I said, well, yeah, how much you have? He said, that whole rig's full of it right there. And he said, and so is that one right there behind us. And, and we unloaded two 18-wheelers of ice that very moment. I'm just, you know, you know I, I'm just saying to you that, that God taught me a lesson in, in, in that area of my weakness and that is that, that my life is not a performance where I learn how to perform well and do great things. My life, the man that I am now, is a person who depends on the Lord because he taught me that in, in, in an area in which I wanted to give up in defeat. But some people, some people try, they just give up. Here's the second thing. Folks, cover up in deception. Now, to cover up means that I'm covering my weakness and I'm pretending that my weakness doesn't exist. Jesus hated the spirit of the Pharisees. The spirit of the Pharisees was a, a spirit of covering up their weakness. As a matter of fact, here's what Jesus said. Jesus says, you guys are whitewashed sepulchers, whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. By that, he says, you think you're something, but you're just full of death. <laughs> that, that, that's all you are. And so the, the, the first act in the book of Genesis, God said, let there be light and God works in the light and the devil works in the darkness. And so the devil encourages us because of shame and fear to keep our weaknesses in the darkness. And God can't help us when our weaknesses are in the darkness and they stay in the darkness because if we're pretending, God can't help us. As a matter of fact, here's what James 5 says. You remember what James 5, you remember James in the Bible? He said, confess your faults, right, one to another, and pray for one another that you might be healed. What is that saying? That is saying, unless I'm misinterpreting it, that uh, sometimes there are things in our life that are not going to be healed until we tell somebody, right? Right? Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Implying that if you don't confess and if you don't tell somebody, your, your weakness is going to stay in the darkness and God's not going to be able to do anything to heal you in life, right? Now, we don't need to tell everybody our weakness, but sometimes we need to, do, need to tell somebody. 
so that, that, so that they can pray for us and, and not try to cover up the weaknesses in our life. But if we will, because that's the darkness, if we will confess them, we bring them into the light and God says, okay, I can do something about it. Here's the third way. Some people try to blow up in defiance. By that, I'm talking about rather than uh, accepting something in my life as a weakness or something that I'm missing the mark, maybe I'm below the mark, I, I just, here's what I do. I just declare whatever I'm doing acceptable and then resist God's attention or anyone else's attention to the contrary. And that's the world we live in nowadays. It's called the Cain spirit. How many of you know the story of Cain and Abel? You know this? In the book of Genesis chapter 4, there is the story of the first two people that are born on this earth, their brothers, Cain and Abel. And God says, I want a sacrifice. And so you know the story that Cain and Abel both bring a sacrifice to God. Well, Abel is a shepherd, and Abel goes and gets one of his wonderful lambs, spotless lambs, perfect lambs, and he brings it to the Lord and says, here's my offering to you, Lord. And the Lord receives Abel's offering and accepts Abel's offering and blesses Abel because his offering has been received. Well, Cain was a farmer. And Cain grew vegetables and, and things like that. And so Cain goes out in his fields. And I don't know if he just haphazardly picked some and just said, this is good enough. Or I don't know why. But, all, but, but he, he, br he brings his offering to God, this basket of vegetables or whatever it might have been. And, uh, and, and God rejects his offering. Well, it, rather than, than Cain being humbled and, and being repentant because God had rejected his offering, um, Cain got mad. And here's what the Lord said to Cain. If you will do well, then you will be happy. But if you don't do well, here's what he said to him. Sin is crouching at the door. And sin is desiring to have you but you must reject it. Cain's response, he kills Abel. This is the Cain spirit. The Cain spirit is a spirit that says, you're not going to tell me what to do. It's a defiant spirit. It's a spirit that says, don't tell me what I'm doing wrong. Uh, I don't, I'm not doing wrong. I, I can do whatever I want to, and you're not going to tell me what to do. Now, this is the world we live in today. We live in a world that is hostile to the things of God, a world that is defiant against the things of God, a world that basically looks at God and says, you're not going to tell me what to do. This is a world that rejects God. This is a world that, uh, uh, that looks in the face of God and says, we don't need you, we don't want you, and we don't care what you think about things. You wonder where that kind of spirit comes from? It's the Cain spirit. It's that same spirit that motivated Cain to say, you're not going to tell me what to do. And he killed Abel. And this is, a, this is the spirit that produces uh, uh, the world's opinion on things nowadays, like abortion. That is, there are some states in our country that say the uh, birthing room and the abortion room, there's no difference between those two. I mean, you can kill babies up to the last trimester and even after they've been born. This is all right and acceptable with God. That we're created by nothing, that we came from uh, one-celled animals and this is everything. There's no special creation of man. We're not created in the image of God. There's no uniqueness about us. There's nothing special about us. That we have the ability to control everything that happens on the earth with this ridiculous man-made warming and all of that kind of stuff. Like we can do something about it. We're masters of our soul. We're masters of our destiny. This is the Cain spirit in life. And this is the spirit of today that says one religion is as good as another. And the only thing that is hated on this earth would be the spirit of Christ not any other spirit. And this is what controls the world we live in. And it's the Cain spirit. Let me show you what this is a fulfillment of. I'm just going to make this real quick. In Psalms 2, this is what the Bible says is going to happen in these last days. All right? Here it is. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? All right? They have something in mind that is, uh, is vanity. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointing, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. In other words, the world looks at God and says, you're not going to tell us what to do. 
And what we're going to do is we're going to take away this world from you. We're going to disobey you. And we're going to, we're not, we're going to tear you down from heaven. In other words, it's like watching a bunch of two-year-olds plot to take over their, uh, uh, take over their home and, uh, and, and kill their parents. <laughs> I mean, it's like watching a bunch of two-year-olds say, I'm going to get rid of my parents and then we're going to take over the house. We're not going to do what you say, and so we're going to take away your, the control from you. Now, if you'd like to know what God thinks about this, look, the very next verse. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. God's going to say, you think you can live without me? You think you're going to wrestle the, the world away from me? <laughs> oh, my Lord. And he just sits in heaven and laughs. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress uh, and distress them in his deep displeasure. Look, look at verse 12. It's one of the most interesting verses there. Uh, kiss the sun. See that? The, S -O, the capital S-O-N. Kiss the sun. In other words, God says, you better kiss the sun. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you some, some uh, counsel. Uh, you better kiss the sun while you have time to kiss the sun. You better, you better listen to the word. You better change the way you're living. You better, you better kiss the sun because if you don't, he, he'll be angry and you'll perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. In other words, there's coming a time. You think you are going to wrestle this world away from God. You can forget that, but this world is defiant, and God says, hey, you better kiss the sun while you have time because time's running out, and you're not going to wrestle God away. But anyway, that's the spirit of defiance. Here's the last one, and this is the right one. We have to offer up our weakness to the divine. And if you'll just bow your head with me one second. Let's do something here very, very quickly, all right? Just bow your head with me one second. We're to offer up our weakness to God. Because God can do something with our weaknesses. And here's what, what, we're, what I'm going to encourage you to do. All right, right now in your own spirit and your own heart, now don't look around at anybody else and you don't have to say these things out loud because it's really not an issue of, of uh, putting you on the spot. It's, it, this is dealing with the Lord. This is the way we, can, we deal with our weaknesses. All right, let's just say the Lord something similar to this in our spirit. Lord, I'm accepting the fact that I have some weaknesses in my life. Now, you may know exactly what they are, and if you do, just say it to yourself. Say, Lord, this is a weakness in my life. I mean, come on, own it now. I mean, God's not going to be able to do anything with it if you're not going to own it, if you're not going to bring it in the light, if you're denying it or covering it up or trying to be deceptive about it or whatever it might be. It's not going to get dealt with. But you need to say, Lord, I recognize this as a weakness in my life. And if there isn't anything in your mind right now, ask the Lord, Lord, uh, expose to me what are the weaknesses of my life. Because you, 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 know, you may be deceived sometimes yourself about this, but you ask him, Lord, expose the weaknesses. And Lord, I admit this weakness. And, 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 and instead of being ashamed of them, Lord, I, I'm going to just now say to you that I recognize this in my life. And I'm going to ask you to come into this weakness and to glorify yourself through this weakness in my life. Instead of being ashamed of it, just say, just say to the Lord, instead of being ashamed of it, Lord, I want, to just, I want to present it to you so that we can bring this into the light and you can work in this in, in my life. I, I can't do anything with it. I'm dependent completely on you. I don't, I've been controlled by this in my life. I, I don't want it to be controlled, so Lord, I'm bringing it to you. Now, here is what happens when you bring this weakness to the Lord. The Lord breaks in your life that fear of man and that fear of rejection. That'll be the first thing that happens. When, when you turn your weaknesses toward God, God begins to work in, in that revelation by breaking away from you the fear of what others might think or others might say or the fact that you'll be rejected. And also, uh, he breaks that spirit of self-hate off of you. The devil wants you to receive your weakness and hate God. If God loved me, I wouldn't have this. And so the enemy tries to do that. And then there's a, a breaking of that spirit of performance it, it, there's a breaking of that tendency to try to hide these things from others and put that mask on and not be healed in life. 
So, Father, I lay this before you, and I understand that I'm, as a man, I'm weak. I know that these are issues of my life, and so, Father, I'm praying right now that, that I'm, I'm just a child. I, I, I lay this before you. I can't do anything about this, so, God, I'm laying it before you. You are awesome. You are forgiving. You are full of grace, and, Father, I, I know that you work in everyone's life that you'll work in my life just like you worked in the life of Paul, like you've worked in every life that has ever turned itself over to you. And I'm giving myself right now, and I'm, I, and I'm asking you to change in my life what I can't change. Now, if you lay that before the Lord, the Lord's going to begin to move in the light of your life. And as, as, as the days move on, here's what you need to do. You need to pay attention to what God's saying or doing in life. And when something exposes itself, especially in the area that you've been praying about, uh, stop and look at it. I, I know a lot of times we pray things to the Lord, and then when the Lord begins to speak, we, we act like we didn't pray, you know, and we don't examine what it is. If it's something, if it's a magazine article, if it's a discussion, whatever it is, look at what God says, and God may be giving you some instruction about that thing. Open your Bible. Look at what the Word says about the things in your life, and God will give you instruction because it's not going to be uh, through strength and all of those things that these things are broken in our life. It's going to be through the Holy Spirit and the grace of God as God works in our life. Father, we receive that. We pray for that. And we lay it before you. And each day as we lay these things before you, we know that your Holy Spirit is going to lead us so that these things can become strengths in our life and not weakness. And we pray it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. All right, praise the Lord. Now, I know you're probably looking at me saying, can it really be that simple? Uh, yeah, it really can. Because you know why? Because that's the way God does things in our life. It's not because we're great masters at learning how to do new things. It's because the Holy Spirit breaks these things free in our life. That's what salvation is. That's what change is. And God will do it in our life. All right. Would you stand here?